from Saudi Arabia and a voice from Russia, two of the biggest players in that decision. Let's kick off with Frank Kane, who is the senior columnist with the Arab News, the lar largest English language daily newspaper in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia, I should say. Frank, prices up again in Asia today. It must be happy days in the kingdom. Yeah, sure. Well, they, they are, uh, it was at 66, nearly 67 when I last looked. Um, they, they are uh, patting themselves on the back, you know, for a job well done via OPEC Plus. This is what they wanted to do. They wanted to get it back up. They wanted to, you know, go some way towards rebalancing. Uh, and, and they seem to be doing that, you know, uh, steadily and surely. Um, I wonder, however, whether uh, at these levels uh, is quite where they want to be ahead of the March the 4th meeting, because this encourages all sorts of delinquent behaviour, doesn't it, uh, by other members. Um, and, of course, it uh, also encourages shale. So, um, you know, I wonder whether the long-term thinking might be uh, uh, edging towards well you know it'd be, it, it would be nicer if, if it was down a little bit just for the psychological effect ahead of uh, March the 4th uh, and I, I mean I must say I, I, I was just speaking to Vitaly in the virtual green room there um, and uh, you, you know wondering what the Russians think of it at this kind of level uh, but but the Saudis you, the, uh, the, the thinking is still uh, ultra cautious, you know, they don't want to do anything dramatic. Uh, there was a debate going on about the 1 million uh, uh, barrels that they took off uh, 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 back in January, you know, that lasted for the months of uh, February and March. There, there is a debate about whether that goes back on, whether all of it goes on, whether it's a phased reintroduction of that supply. So, you know, there is still a, a lot of time to go uh, and there, there are conversations going on at the highest levels between Moscow and Riyadh, of course, uh, uh, because this is a very uh, serious thing for the kingdom and for OPEC+. Plus. Well, let's go to Moscow with Vitaly Yermakov, Senior Research Fellow at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. Vitaly, this has become perhaps a more complicated uh, market review than it was going to be. We, we have prices jumping out of Asia this morning on the back of news that the, the, lo the sort of closure of 2 million barrels of oil a day in the US is going to take weeks to recover, uh, not days. And, and we had some uh, price forecasting here on this show in recent days that said if that was the case, prices could get to $70 before OPEC meets. Uh, this is an unusual circumstance. Does OPEC plus look through this and sees the longer story, the longer demand or the weaker demand recovery, or does these current circumstances impact the thinking in Moscow, do you think? Oh, good morning, good morning, everyone. Uh, I don't have any insider knowledge of uh, their thinking, but uh, okay, next. I've, I've, been, I've, been, I've, been, I've been always saying that uh, the, rationale, the, rationale, the rationale seems to be pretty straightforward. Uh, for Russia, the fiscal break-even price for this year is $43 per barrel. For Saudi Arabia, I saw the estimates by the IMF, uh, fiscal break-even price for the Saudis was uh, slightly higher than 80 bucks. Uh, last year, probably slightly lower than that this year because of their efforts to uh, cut some spending. But this sort of, this sets the range. Uh, obviously, Saudi Arabia wants uh, higher prices, Russia can be uh, satisfied with uh, prices of about 50 bucks and will be happy with that. Uh, and so the range of 50 to 70 dollars, I think it, it, it is something that we can uh, look forward to. Uh, and of course, there will be a lot of volatility. Now, in the short term, uh, I think the, the, the mass in Texas is going to help to make this decision. Obviously the Saudis, uh, they did this voluntary cut of one uh, million barrels per day and uh, they can return to their original uh, quarter at, at any time. And I think it would be easier for them to do so now. 
Lori, I mean, besides the situation in Texas complicating matters in terms of where real supply and demand is, we have this uh, 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 new rapprochement with Iran and the US now looking like it's building some tangible momentum. Uh, your views on the impact of those things into the cocktail? Oh, well, uh, so for those who say uh, who thought that this will be like a quick fix and the Iranian uh, oil and gas will be back uh, the soonest, I don't think that will be the case. So the Iranians were pushing for the uh, for the first stop, which was the twenty first of February, pushing, saying that you have only from the day that Biden took uh, took. Uh, uh, over to the 21st of February, which was like the day that they said that after that we're not going to apply the additional protocol, uh, that uh, that uh, stop has passed, and now they're saying no, we will we will continue applying and uh, abiding by. So now the second step for them to pressure will be the elections in, in Iran. So the Iranians are pushing the Americans to come back to the uh, not to come back actually. It's like they're just pushing to re to remove the sanctions. And the Americans are not in that state uh, mindset. They're saying they're not going to remove any sanctions before you stop uh, uh, your activities. So I think, again, we're at this situation where we, it's all about sequencing. Who does what first? This is one. Uh, the second, I, I mean, they do feel it does feel like they are getting closer to the idea of moving in tandem, that they, they, nobody has to move first, but there is a slow graduation towards we dance together. And maybe the dance floor will be the EU, right? Because the EU is ready to, uh, to play that mediator. But the other problem that I'm seeing is that the scope of the uh, negotiation. So the, the uh, again, Iranians are saying that we don't want to change the scope. We don't want to discuss about our uh, missile activities. We don't want to discuss about our role in the region. And the U.S. Was, uh, the U.S. Uh, president was very clear. He said, "Yes, there is this issue about the JCPOA. We go or we don't go back. But again, we need to take into consideration the destabilizing role of Iran in the region. So all of these are not settled yet, right? So until this is not settled, I don't think the sanctions will be removed. I don't think there will be a legitimate." come back of the Iranian oil and gas. Now we are seeing the rug, if you want, come back, but the legitimate comeback might not be like the soonest we can expect. Well, so it certainly, it would be, it, it be interesting to see if there's any wiggle room before the elections. Uh, inevitably, the, the, the politics of the Iranian elections, people will want to save face. Uh, but I thought it was interesting that uh, uh, Sarif was saying after, in the announcement of the European meeting, that the Iran would be seeking compensation uh, of the trillion dollars that they've lost due to the Trump sanctions of the recent years, just to add a few more complicated layers to, to navigate through. But meanwhile, Frank, back in the deserts of Arabia, uh, or Arabia uh, known as Saudi, or however the advertising campaign is going, I can't turn on my computer or my, uh, or my billboards on the highway without seeing Saudi Arabia being advertised for its uh, tourism which I do look forward to at some point in time going to, but that's not my question. My question ultimately is, what has defined Saudi's navigation of the last year has been austerity. Uh, and now prices are back to a point. Uh, are they going to ease off of that a bit? We saw in the last week uh, this, an announcement that was compelling international companies to set up their Middle East headquarters in the kingdom. Could you give us an update on that and what that means, do you think, for the recovery in Saudi Arabia? Yeah, um, on, the, on the economy, um, I don't think higher oil prices will do much to, you know, to change the outlook for this year. Anyway, you know, the budget is set. VAT is certainly going to carry on at 15 percent. There is no, the, uh, no plans to change that. Um, so I, I think that's more or less set. But um, the the uh, the Riyadh announcement, I, um, uh, uh, to be clear on this, you know, this this wasn't compelling them to be in Riyadh, but they had to be in Riyadh if they want to do business with the government. You know, that would that was the crux of it. Uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, I interviewed the investment minister Khalid Al Fali uh, last week. 
uh, and he he added some uh, 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 details to this. And um, you know, it it seems they they are serious about this. You know, they they want any multinational that wants to do business with the government of Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, they want them to set up a a real regional headquarters i.e. with C-suite executives, with back office facilities, with training functions there, support staff, every, everything else, you know, not, not just a brass plaque. Uh, he, he, he was adamant about that. He also talked more about the kind of region that he imagined, you know, because in theory you could carve up a region and call it Saudi Arabia and make that your regional HQ. But no, he, he talked about a region that encompassed uh, West Asia, the Middle East, North Africa, and some parts of Africa. So, you know, that, so why that, do you that, think it was necessary or did the interview with the minister reveal why they felt it was necessary to kind of mandate it as a requirement in order to win government business that it wouldn't just happen organically? Yeah, I, I well, I, I, I did ask him that. Uh, I, I said, isn't, isn't it? I asked, isn't it rather too much uh, stick and not enough carrots? And his response was, well, we are doing both, of course. You know, we are also explaining to, uh, you know, global investors the attractions of the Saudi economy, the biggest in the region, uh, the, uh, the huge opportunities that there are. You know, he quoted the figure of $3 trillion worth of investment opportunities that the Crown Prince has mentioned before. You know, get a, get a chunk of that. Uh, of course, that wouldn't be lost on businesses of that opportunity. I'm just wondering, it seemed to me that this was organically already something that was underway. And now it begs the question, well, what's the next mandate that they're going to ask or demand? And, and perhaps mm -hmm. in time, we'll see if it was the wisest decision in the world. Obviously, they I have to tell you his, his uh, 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 succinct and quite revealing uh, answer was it is in our interest and it is our right. So of course, it's certainly the right. I wonder yeah. if we it is, it and it suits us. I, th I think is the, is, the, is the crux of it. Yeah, and certainly everybody, and uh, Dubai included, will have to take pay attention and and uh, get more competitive. And maybe that's a good thing for uh, FDI. It's always a, it's a big world. Everybody needs to compete for it. And and in the these very interesting thing, Sean, if I could just highlight, yeah. said uh, was the fact that Saudiization. Uh, rules would not apply um, for these uh, multinationals who wanted to set up regional HQs. Uh, and, and that was a choice rather than a forced measure. That was his exact words. It, it, it is a choice for you know, big global companies, uh, whether they adhere to Saudiization rules or not. Interesting. You know, illuminating. The, the, that's that's certainly uh, um, something to pay attention to and to watch as, as the uh, program goes forward. Vision 2030 remains on track and is obviously a major component. And so oil price being a big engine to that. But Vitaly, meanwhile, back in Russia, in terms of the outlook for the COVID recovery, it appears that OPEC Plus uh, goes into the next meeting, covid feels like it's drifting behind us. Is that the sense in Russia? And will Russia, do you think, be pushing for the opportunity to increase supply as they did at the last meeting? Well, Sean, I'm glad you mentioned that because I took my second shot of the vaccine just a few days ago. Mabru. And I think many people now, especially in Moscow, in the capital, uh, have uh, taken both shots of the vaccine. Uh, it, it, it is taken longer in the provinces. But I think Russia generally is, is going through this immunization process. And globally, I believe uh, by April, May of this year, uh, in Europe and in the US, the vaccination levels uh, will be close to 60% of, 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 of total population, which probably will uh, start the process of uh, reopening borders and uh, international uh, flights will, will return. And yeah, I guess the, the overall sense, and not just in Russia, but pretty much everywhere, is that uh, by summer, uh, the world will be reopening for business. For you now, think the, Russia, the, Ru the SOCAR forecast we have in the digest today, and our own uh, Omar Najee of BB Energy has called this earlier that we could see $80 oil this year now? 
Oh, eighty dollar oil. I I, uh, I saw Goldman Goldman Sachs has increased their outlook for seventy five. I think. So yeah, I think if you look at a uh, combination of factors, uh, two billion dollars that the U.S. is going to uh, print essentially uh, will we'll have to find its way somewhere. And uh, the hard choice between Bitcoin and uh, oil uh, is going to be made by many investors. Something that has no intrinsic value and something that can save you, at least you can put it in your car and uh, not freeze to death as many Texans did uh, just last week. But Vitaly, you said there that uh, the Russians are happy with $50. It's, it's, it's a price they can live with. But at the same token, they seem to be, you know, they have a lot of stakeholders, independent companies and so forth that, uh, you know, are pushing for more. Uh, and that uh, while we're all content with 50, we'd like 70. But where do you think the pressure is in Saudi, in uh, Russia to for more, for moving faster, as compared to the Saudi approach, which we heard the minister last week, I think his quote was extreme caution. Oh, but Sean, but in, 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 the, in the context of your question, moving faster, uh, you probably mean uh, relaxing the quotas, but this, yes. would, I mean, result, we were meant to, but this would result in low prices. And indeed, many Russian companies, they, uh, they insist that uh, they need to produce more because uh, they had to introduce very difficult trade-offs for themselves in uh, containing the output. And uh, they would be really relieved to be able to produce more because the fear is that if uh, the uh, oil wells are idle for longer, uh, a lot of uh, reserves could be lost forever. So that, that's, that, that's the main uh, rationale behind the insistence of many Russian companies to uh, return to pre-crisis levels of production. Lori, but, this the other... would, but this would mean lower prices, not higher prices. And as, and as I said, for Russia, it's, uh, it's easier to do so because they're comfortable with $50 oil. Right. Uh, Lori, the, the other pressure that's coming into the market, uh, India, very large, obviously, consumer, big economy in Asia, uh, is, is starting to shout a little louder about the pain from higher prices, or at least the speed in which they're experiencing uh, again today, uh, reports this morning, uh, diesel and petrol reading further record high levels in uh, Delhi and the major cities in India. Where do you think the pressure from that starts to play uh, its part in impacting decisions that come next? So definitely you need consumers, right? And you need to make consumers happy because already demand has collapsed, has collapsed or never, it's, not, it's not back. And we are, we are very optimistic, yes. And everybody's saying that we will be uh, out uh, and traveling by uh, by uh, mid this year. So I don't know, like, let's hope that that will be the case. And there's a lot saying that now the only thing is like the jet fuel once we travel again. So that means that everything is normal and we'll forget about the COVID. And well, last and night, the airlines, uh, Ryanair, EasyJet and out of the UK were reporting a big spike in bookings after the announcement by the British government to permit travel this summer. Exactly. So these are like good, uh, good news, I guess. But again, like uh, to come back to the consumers, this is something that I think OPEC, OPEC Plus will be taking into consideration, especially that it's coming from, uh, from Asia and especially from uh, India. India is, is, uh, is in all the analysis that we see, it's the growing uh, economy. This is where the uh, oil and gas demand will be, etc. So they're playing their role that to, uh, we are the top consumers and now we have a say in this. You cannot be only, it's not only about suppliers. It's not about top producers and how they, they play out the market. We have a say in this. And I remember one of your guests said that even the in Indians were saying that if you don't, uh, if you don't bring back the, uh, the production and bring down the prices, we will invest in renewables. So this is interesting. Well, like they've, also, they've also and, been leaking out of uh, unnamed sources in the government exactly. that they would be willing to st engage Iran again and exactly. maybe circumnavigate the sanctions to import. So they're, playing that, they're playing all the cards in their hands so that they would push OPEC plus 
to uh, bring back the uh, uh, the the extra uh, barrels that they had promised. You remember, like the plan was initially to bring back two million barrels by April. So I think. With that in mind, it will not be an easy uh, decision for OPEC Plus uh, to take when they meet in March, uh, on March 4th, I guess. It's, uh, yes, uh, look, when you see Iraqis now de canceling the prepayment uh, deal, uh, is it technical or it's because now they're happy with the prices and they see that there's a spike in prices so they can live now with that? They don't need the cash that they wanted to uh, get from the, uh, from the uh, Chinese. So is that a, a, an indicator that now the producers are happy? You remember, like Alex Nova, Alexander Novak had said, you need to live with a price ranging between 45 and 55. Now we're at 65. So I think that, uh, 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 so it, it, it is kind of like producers are happy. Yes, they want to produce, they want to keep the prices going up, but at the same time, they, knew, they, knew, uh, they know that they're hearing the consumers uh, and so it, it, it's and tricky. on that point, Frank, the, the Indian minister was on the uh, same platform as the Saudi minister last week and was quite robust in his comments about uh, uh, the OPEC plus making greater efforts to add yeah, supply and, yeah. and curtail the price. And the idea that they would then be willing to take some uh, sort of sanction busting with Iran, that must add a bit to the cocktail in Saudi's decision making, because, of course, India is a very, very important partner for Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's another reason why I, I think it's in Saudi's interest for the price not to rise so fast as we've seen. Uh, you know, they do want higher prices, but they don't want them going through the roof. You know, that causes all sorts of problems, not least with somebody like India. Uh, the the uh, India Petroleum Minister, he also made the point, you know, uh, 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 he, he highlighted the fact that India is is committed to a big renewable program. And, and it was almost like the, the uh, uh, a, a veiled threat, you know, uh, uh, we will increase our spend on renewables if you don't give us cheaper oil, you know, seemed to be the kind of option that he was presenting on that forum last week. It was the... Uh, the, the IEF, the International Energy Forum, they, you know, they had to do. Is there, uh, is there on the Iran uh, question, uh, Frank, is there much coverage in your paper, in the papers in the kingdom about this rapprochement with the US? Is, is, what's the sentiment? There, there is quite a lot of coverage of it. Uh, I wouldn't say much of it is analytical. Right. Um, but uh, because Saudi has very, uh, you know, uh, firm, firm views on Iran and uh, and, uh, you know, it, I mean, one it, of the components it, that the Americans keep saying in their in their commentary is that they will bring the Gulf to the table. Their voice yeah. will be at the table on this occasion. Yeah. Is that get coverage at all? Uh, well, they want it. You know, they certainly want to be at the table. Uh, uh, but I think uh, uh, just as worrying for Saudi Arabia uh, as the nuclear uh, uh, issue here is the problem of Iranian sponsorship of different groups around the region, you know, some of which are uh, directly targeting Saudi interests, you know, Houthi missiles flying towards, you know, various parts of the kingdom. Right. Uh, you know, that kind of I mean, that's another on. layer to the complication. Yeah. yeah. Of so this if, challenge. If, if, yeah, if, if they could get them to tone things down in, in Lebanon with Hezbollah, in Syria, Iraq, and in Yemen, uh, you know, then that would be a, a big plus for Saudi Arabia. And, 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 and they would like that as, as much as they want some sort of restraint on, on nuclear as well. Well, this return, obviously, of a democratic administration in the U.S. was always going to be a hairy jumper moment for the region as it recalibrates the U.S. posture here. Mm -hmm. uh, the oil sanctions, I think, is a question for survey today. Uh, and we're seeing, obviously, in recent months, the amount of oil being smuggled, quote unquote, sanction busting out of Iran has been growing. Most of the shipping uh, uh, agencies that monitor flows have been reporting increases every month to the extent where it's up to now nearly a million barrels of it a day. My question this morning is, what are the chances of oil export sanctions being eased on Iran within the next six months? Now, of course, eased is a unknown length of piece of string, but nonetheless, some kind of formal, okay, as a goodwill gesture, you can do X barrels a month, a day, whatever. 
uh, something in the negotiation that eases sanctions. Very likely, likely, unlikely. What's the view in the room on the sentiment with that? And whether it makes any difference or not, we won't know. Vitaly, your thoughts, what you will be watching for the rest of the week in terms of the trajectory of the market. Clearly a strong upward move uh, in uh, early trade this week out of Asia. Mm. Well, it's interesting because the past week was the week of paradoxes. I'm wondering whether the, the, the coming week also will uh, be the week of paradoxes. In, in by what parad sense? By, by paradoxes, I mean sort of... Uh, we have the rover on Mars, uh, which is just a great achievement. And at the same time, we have this uh, man-made catastrophe in Texas. We have uh, the, 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 the talk of U.S. Uh, being back to Europe and European, Europeans are saying, well, please, please, no, you cannot enter the same river twice. Uh, and uh, we, we have these uh, outlooks for very high oil prices at the same time uh, we have the fears that uh, these very high prices can cause uh, the switching away from oil to uh, renewables and uh, this sort of this, this introduces the whole range of uncertainties and trade-off and for the for the week ahead uh, well there will maybe a slight correction if indeed there are signs that OPEC plus is moving forward with uh, relaxing its, its, its uh, production restrictions. And I think that this, this price correction uh, could be well justified, but uh, longer term, I think the trend is still uh, upward and we're going to see lots and lots of volatility in the market. And plus, we haven't talked about hedging programs because for the U.S., for many producers in the U.S., especially smaller producers, uh, in order to get financing for their activities, they, they, they absolutely must hedge. And uh, the way the futures curve uh, looked uh, with, with the steep backwardation, sort of the prompt price of uh, the north of 60, uh, probably would mean that uh, the actual hedging uh, especially when you deduct for the very high costs of hedging, uh, would really give uh, the U.S. producers $50, no more than that, even though the, the prompt prices are pretty high. And so it's, it's only now, I guess, that uh, the U.S. producers might want to really hedge the output going forward. And so the, the, the key takeaway from that is that, uh, indeed, the U.S. may respond to higher prices with higher production, but it is not going to be fast. It would take a lot of time. And uh, plus, uh, the big companies, they already said that they are going to target profitability. Rather and than I more. think that's really what's dawned on the market this week is not obviously the, the storm in, a, in, in Texas has knocked out a big amount of production, uh, uh, but it's also brought very much to the fore that the recovery of shale, not only from last week, but from last year, is going to be much slower than yes. uh, it has been in previous years, Frank. And, and as a result, the whole market structure could move upwards. And that's why we're seeing the forecast now talking 70 and $80. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, shale is the big, is the, you know, the big quandary, isn't it, really? Um, uh, the other person who was on that IEF event last week was Vicky Holub uh, of, of Oxy. Um, who, uh, you know, she, she was rather pessimistic about the, you know, the chances of shale ever getting back to, you know, pre-COVID days. Uh, she, she spoke of a $40 uh, 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 break-even point. Uh, and if you, you know, if you couldn't make it work at that or, you know, any, anything around that, then, you know, don't get into the business at all was her message. But of course, we're moving into areas now where there's room for that to work. You know, the shale producers can make it work. So, uh, yeah, that is a big quandary. Uh, 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 but if you want to know what I'm looking at for the rest of the week, Sean, um, uh, uh, Besides uh, there is one big for... thing. Well, we don't want to talk about that too much these yeah. days, Sean. I'm, yeah, I understand. Uh, uh, you can't see the black armband here, but... Uh, I know, I know. But, uh, You'll yeah. be yet another club in which uh, Mourinho is an ex-manager of. Well, I just want him out. Can I say that on the record, <laughs> on camera? I just want him out now. 
Yes, back to Porto. <laughs> but to close but, out uh, your comments. Yeah, exactly. yeah sorry. Uh, 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 there is one big thing uh, uh, which I can't say say too much about, but to mark your card, uh, yeah. you know, the, uh, there is increasing uh, noise from the U.S. That the, uh, that the CIA reports into the murder of Jamal Khashoggi uh, will be released uh, in, the, in the next few days. Uh, that is a big event for the world and for the region. And, and the other thing that I'm keeping an eye on is the IDEX event down in Abu Dhabi, the, uh, uh, the big defense uh, show down there, uh, where there is a big Saudi presence, of, of course, as, as there always is indeed. But I'm told also from people down there, I, I haven't been able to make it myself, uh, uh, that there is a very big Russian and Chinese presence there too. So th this is becoming the uh, 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 defense market. Of and the Israeli, no, I believe as well. I'm sure, yes. Yeah, yeah, that hadn't occurred to me. But uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering if, you know, Biden is cutting off uh, uh, arms sales to various people in this part of the world, then uh, they might be looking elsewhere. Well, there's no shortage of arms sellers anywhere in the world, it seems. That's one thing that's plentiful. That and cocaine, I don't know which one is more. Uh, it seems they're all very much available around the world. Um, let's uh, go to the survey result before closing out. Um, likely, wow, okay, 62%. Mm. Likely uh, to see sanctions eased on Iran, uh, ex oil exports <laughs> over the next six months. Laura, that Laurie, that was for you. That set up to close out today's session. Yeah. So uh, first of all, like if the proxies, the Iranian proxies in the region, uh, continue on attacking U.S. Uh, 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 the U.S. embassy or the green zone in Iraq or in Erbil or any U.S. target, I don't think that the U.S. will will ease any sanction. So they should be really. Uh, taking care of their proxies and what their proxies are doing, the Iranian proxies, I mean. So because this is an escalation, uh, escalating factor and it's not going to have the negotiations. And one other point, I think that the Iranians are feeling that they don't want to go to negotiations. They don't, just want to remove the sanctions and then uh, they, they can apply the JCPOA and that's it, point à la ligne, as we say. So I don't think that will be the situation as well. The Americans will want a new, uh, a new deal. Uh, but let me end on uh, uh, two positive notes from the East Mediterranean. It's been a long time that I didn't Absolutely. give you the... Absolutely. Yes. The East Med, <laughs> our, our special correspondent <laughs> in the East Med. Exactly. So the good news is like... After, Next time like, you'll have to do it on a jet ski, though, you know, reporting on a jet ski from the yeah, East Med. I would love to. I would love to. From Aqaba, huh? There you from go. The Red well, sea, because the Red yeah. Sea is the hot spot, like the Arctic and uh, where uh, Vitali is. So, right. Uh, so uh, basically, Damietta, which is the LNG plant that had been stopped from producing or uh, anything since tw uh, 2012, had the first shipment yesterday uh, sailed out to Bangladesh. So this is a great news for the Egyptian LNG, and it gives you a sense of how the market is moving, and especially the LNG uh, market, uh, especially, of course, with the spike in prices, like from $2 to, the, to 32 so the other news, again, the investments that are happening in the East Mediterranean is this uh, the last month Chevron announced that they want to spend more than $230 million on a pipeline from their Leviathan field in Israel to the LNG plants in Egypt. Uh, yesterday, the ministers of energy in Egypt and uh, Israel signed a deal agreeing on such, uh, uh, such uh, investment. So kind of maybe soon we'll be seeing a pipeline going from the Leviathan field to the Egyptian LNG again, so that the Chevron field would be going into the LNG business. And this is something that we were waiting to see, like how the East Mediterranean gas will leave the region. So, hope, so we're seeing now with all these activities that maybe LNG will be uh, the, uh, the way forward for the gas in the, uh, in the East Mediterranean. So yeah, I stop Allah. there. I have other news as well, like about Gaza and everything. So I'll keep an eye. And then yes. once there is like interesting news, I'll feed you. Three bits of news, as the saying goes. Tomorrow we have the Fujera workshop for those of you interested and available to join us, sort of the outlook for Fujera. 
uh, at uh, 11.30 tomorrow as part of the IP Week virtual conference world. Uh, but thank you, Vitaly, for joining John, us today. These are a lot Frank. of men on the panel. You need to I have know, women. I know, <laughs> I know. Uh, I've yet to find too many women operating in Fujera at the moment in the energy sector. I do apologize because we do try to navigate that. Uh, and that is well identified and mea culpa. Um, Laurie, thank you very much for your thank insights you. today. All the best, everybody. We'll catch up with you later in the week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.